Namaste. Today, I will be speaking about a cohesive history of gravity. Now, let us go back to an unlikely year for this. You might be asking 1950, 1905, no. 384 BC, no. Let us rewind to 2013 when I was only one year old. My father was a part-time math student and a part-time security guard. And so, I was lucky enough to be watching him practice his mathematics. Now, I'm not sure what for, but he was doing so much complicated stuff. I could see these, this sea of abstruse and mem memorable equations, although I still don't have them in my mind right now because I'm terrible at memory. I saw all these abstruse, complex, yet memorable equations. And when I looked at each one, it burned in my brain as I tried to figure out what it meant. But I couldn't on my own. I could see the signs repeating over and over but I couldn't see what they meant or any meaning in them. Um, and so, I didn't give up. Perseverance at an early age. I, one day, when my father left, I leapt for his shock. That was the source of all the magical, uh, the magical trail that he left in his wake. Maybe I could do it too. Maybe I could finally understand the equations. But I just picked up that chalk. So I leapt for it. And I got it. But then, as soon as I saw it, I started making unintelligible scribbles on the blackboard. It was honestly an amazing sight. After my failure, I decided to tuck that piece of chalk under the bed. Just in case I would get to see it again. However, the next day, I woke up, checked on my chalk, and I woke up to a harrowing sight. I had crushed the chalk under my little baby legs. First of all, I'm not sure how it happened, but second, it was just so emotional. I don't know why I, I grew emotionally attached to a piece of chalk. I guess I wasn't that emotionally developed at the time. But I, I, I really loved that piece of chalk. And so it really struck me when I saw it just broken, lying under the bed. But what struck me more was the consequences of my accent, what everybody else would think when they opened the bed sheet or changed the bed sheet and then just saw a blot of yellow chalk. But that day, regardless, was the day I fell in love with math. I was just so fascinated with all these equations and I really wanted to start learning them and doing them on my own. I was astonished by the creativity it took to take these building blocks, these individual symbols that seemed nearly meaningless on their own and build them into something which had so much meaning for the world and could express the world in such great ways. Mathematics is a way to express the world, but is also a way to find out the world. And it was honestly such a great moment for me when I discovered the meaning of those equations. And now I didn't really get up to the level of what my father was doing until uh, about when I was seven or eight and doing linear algebra and stuff like that. And so, but still, it was so magical to me, my first experience with math. Now, science was a bit of a more rocky journey. Science can be classified as a lot of things. Biology, ecology, chemistry. Well, it can be classified as lots and lots of things. But what I did, I did the physical sector of science. So I fell in love with physics. And so on my, I still have a bit of bias towards math. And back then, I had all the bias towards math. I d didn't really like science because I thought that science was 
boring that it restricted your freedom and I because of the natural rules and I was being taught this before my second birthday so I was naive and stubborn and thought that math was better than science and I still today because of the freedom that math provides compared to science uh, are on the little edge of math bias I just like math you know it's why I uh, I first put up an equation in mathematics and why I really like mathematics just a bit over science. And so, well, I fell in love with science, however, or physics rather, on my second birthday. On my second birthday, I requested a, a humongous prize. Not some toys, some games, or even some cash. <laughs> I mean, what would a two-year-old do with cash? Now I'm thinking. And, but, rather, I requested a challenge. And my father accepted the request. So, well, I heard my father calling me out to our garage. However, when I looked at the garage, I saw absolutely nothing. None of the greasy paint cans or the rotten food cans or that broken heater in the middle. But I rather saw a completely cleared out space. And so that, oh jeez, okay. And, and so the cannon kept shooting out cannonball after cannonball until one was shot with so much force that it went out into orbit. Now, I promise that I will explain this later. I promise. You might be thinking, again, what the frick? And so, uh, but I promise you this is related. Why? Well, combined with the old-timey nature of the book, it was just so old, it looked like somebody had spilled coffee over it. And combine that with that, uh, this drawing, I realized that when, at the low forces, when the cannonball was shot with low force, it was analogous to an apple falling, just like Newton had imagined, or rather Newton had seen. I also thought that the cannonball, when it has so much force exerted on it that it is inside orbit, that is analogous to the moon. <gasps> if an apple can fall, why can't the moon fall? That's what Sir Isaac Newton imagined. And so, I got it. I got it, folks. The author must have been Sir Isaac Newton. However, however what was the name? After lots of thinking, I got the name Newton's Cannonball. And that wasn't the name of the book. It was something in Latin that I can't bother to remember, although it was one of Newton's less famous works. It wasn't Principia. Fact is, Newton's Cannonball, I got it partially right, right? Because, well, coincidentally, after, a few months ago, I found after researching and getting lost in a rabbit hole, that an, the image of a cannon in the earth is actually referred to Newton's cannonball. It's actually referred to as Newton's cannonball, meaning I got him partially right. Right? Or wrong. But it was just one image in one page of a huge book, so I guess I didn't get it personally right. However, that was the day I fell in love with science. Ever since then, I have been trying to form a cohesive history of many things in science. Some like kinematics, which I will believe might be the next topic, uh, the topic of my next book, Chalk. However, um, recently I have one, lots of uh, too many endeavors to work on that, and two, I feel like there's not a lot to fix it because one, I, I feel like the quality wasn't good because the last time I worked on it was around when I was eight. And so, I believe that, uh, I believe that the history of gravity, after refining it for so long, 
speaking at so many universities. I feel like I have finally made it ripe. I don't know. I guess I've just been waiting for the tree to blossom. It's winter now, but you get the analogy, right? Right? Anyway, this is the history of gravity. A cohesive history starting from the roots of gravity to the seed that made gra um, gravity. It was, it was actually a seed because that seed grew into an apple, which fell next to Newton, who imagined gravity. The seed that uh, gravity came from. And what blossomed out of it? Not just the apple, but the, the world of physics. Has now been, this is one of the cornerstones of the world of physics. 